In this video, we'll discuss bijective functions. We'll start with some definitions, then the link between bijections and inverse functions. This, along with some help from the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, will lead nicely onto bijections and set cardinalities. We'll then apply these ideas to infinitely large sets. But first, a well-known problem written in a slightly non-standard way. If x is an infinite subset of the real numbers, then there's either a bijective function from x to the real numbers, or there's a bijective function from the natural numbers to x. Now, this statement seems innocuous enough, but in reality, whether this is true or not is still controversial. In fact, using standard set theory axioms, it's been proved to be undecidable. That's neither true nor false. By the end of this video, we'll understand what's going on here, but we need to start with some definitions. A function f from set A to set B maps A onto a subset of the set B. We call A the domain of the function and B the codomain. The subset of B f maps A onto is called the image of f, and that's defined as a set of all elements y in B such that y is of the form f of x for x in A. By definition, a function must follow two rules. Rule 1 ensures that, given any element x in A, there is always a corresponding y in B such that f of x is equal to y. In everyday language, that means that the function must give a valid output for every value put into it. By Rule 2, we also prevent a single value from the domain A being mapped to two distinct values y and z in the codomain B. We say that if there exist y and z in B such that f of x equals y and f of x equals z for some x in A, then y must be equal to z. A function f from A to B can be injective, surjective, bijective or none of the above. An injective function doesn't map two distinct elements in A onto the same element in B. We say that for x and y in A, if f of x equals f of y, then x must equal y. Injective functions are sometimes called one-to-one -one functions. A surjective function is one where every element in the codomain B is of the form f of x. We could also define a surjective function as one where the image of f is equal to the codomain, and surjective functions are sometimes referred to as onto. A bijective function is both injective and surjective, that is, every element in A is mapped to a unique element in B, and every element in B is of the form f of x for some element in A. The reason we care is because if a function f is bijective, then there exists an inverse function f to the minus 1, which essentially reverses the function. Given that f of x maps every element in A to an element in B, the inverse of f maps the elements in B back onto A, but specifically in such a way that all the elements f of x in B are mapped to the original x in A. Let's look a little bit more closely at the link between bijections and inverse functions by sketching out a proof that if a function has an inverse, it must be bijective. Let f be a function from A to B and g be a function from B to A. G is what we call a left inverse of f if g of f maps every x in A to itself. That is, we apply f first, then g, and we end up back where we started. There might be other elements in B outside of the image of f, but we don't need to worry about where they're mapped to. Also, notice that f must be injective in order for there to exist a left inverse. G is a right inverse of f if we apply g to b first and then f maps the image of g back to the original elements in b. Since this applies to all elements in b, this means that f must be surjective. Finally, an inverse function, g, must be both a left and a right inverse of f. To summarise, if a function has an inverse f to the minus 1, then it must be a left inverse and therefore it's injective, and a right inverse and therefore it's surjective. But if it's both injective and surjective, it's therefore bijective. Interestingly, you don't need to specifically show that f is bijective. The Schroeder-Bernstein theorem says that if there exists an injective function from A to B, 
and there exists an injective function from B to A, then there exists a bijection from A to B. This is because in order for there to exist an injective function from A to B, then B must be at least as big as A. If there exists an injective function from B to A, then A must be at least as big as B. Therefore, the sets A and B must be the same size. I guess the next question which follows from this is if two sets are the same size, does this mean that there's a bijection between them? We call the size of a set its cardinality. And the cardinality of a finite set is the number of elements it contains. So if we let A equals the set containing 1, 2, 3 and 4, then the cardinality of A, as indicated by these vertical lines, is 4. And if we have finite sets A and B, then of course a bijection between them means that we can essentially pair up all elements in A and B. And so the cardinalities of the two sets must be equal. But the link between bijections and cardinality is arguably more useful when we're dealing with infinite sets. By definition, the cardinalities of two sets, finite or infinite, are the same if there exists a bijection between them. For example, the set of natural numbers n has the same cardinality as a set of positive even numbers, because the function f of x equals 2 times x is a bijection between them. We can also show that the rational numbers have the same cardinality as the natural numbers by constructing a bijection between them. We line up sequences of rationals, starting with 1 over n, 2 over n and so on, and the negative rationals on the other side, then spiralling outwards, taking care to avoid repeated fractions, we can go through them all one by one and so there exists a bijection between them. However, the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly greater than that of the natural numbers. In fact, the real numbers between 0 and 1 is larger than the set of natural numbers. The following is known as Cantor's diagonalization argument. Let g be a function from n to the interval 0 to 1 in R. We can line up the natural numbers with the real numbers. Let's assume we've associated all the real numbers between 0 and 1 with the corresponding natural number. We can construct a new number x by taking the nth significant figure of the nth real number in the list and adding 1. This then forms the nth significant figure of x. 6 becomes 7, 2 becomes 3, etc. If we encounter a 9, we change it to a 0. Since x differs at at least one decimal place from all the real numbers in the list, then we can't have found every one of them. So whatever this function g is, we found an element x in the codomain of g which isn't in the image of g. So g is injective, but it can't be surjective. Therefore, we have the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same as the rationals. We call this aleph null, or countably infinite. The cardinality of the real numbers is denoted c for continuum, and we call this uncountably infinite. What we've shown with Cantor's diagonalization is that aleph null is strictly less than c. We can now come back to our original problem. Let x be an infinitely large subset of the real numbers. Then there's either a bijective function f from x to the set of real numbers, or there is a bijective function g from the set of positive integers to x. Using what we now know about bijections, we can see this implies that the cardinality of x is either equal to aleph null or c. Notice that there are only two choices here and nothing in between. That's because there's no set whose cardinality is between that of the natural numbers and the real numbers. This statement is known as the continuum hypothesis and was put forward by Georg Cantor in 1878. Not only has this still not been proven, we might never know whether this is true or false. In 1963, Paul Cohen published a paper alongside early work by Kurt Gödel which proved that the continuum hypothesis is independent of the axioms of set theory. That is, it's undecidable and can't be proved true or false given other axioms. It's a topic that's still regarded as open or unfinished by many mathematicians and philosophers to this day. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.